is Joe Intel. Let's take a look at what you should look for when purchasing your subwoofer. So I'm gonna break it down into things I look for in a subwoofer itself, what makes a good subwoofer. Then I wanna talk about the importance of DSP. We wanna take a look and see whether something is a good buy for you specifically. So the first thing I'd look at is whether the subwoofer is within your budget. You'll find subwoofers in the under $200 category. You'll find some 500-ish, 1,000, and it goes up from there. So of course, if something's outside of your budget, it's really a non-issue. It's just not within your budget. And so that's the first thing to look at. So assuming that you find a set of subwoofers that are within your budget, now you wanna decide which one is right for you. The first thing I would look for is how low it plays. And a lot of times the manufacturers will specify a minus three dB point. And usually you wanna find one that's anechoic, meaning that it's not in the room because the room itself adds bass response. So sometimes you'll find something where it shows both the anechoic and in-room response and the in-room one will always be lower. What I personally look for is something that will play 20 Hertz and below, the lower the better, because that's where all the crazy low frequencies are in movies. A lot of times in music, they don't often go below 30 Hertz, but depending on type of music, they can. So that's one thing to consider is the type of music as well. And it also depends on what your expectations are. So if you're spending a little bit less, then a lot of those don't really play down to 20 Hertz compared to some of the more expensive ones. I've found that you have to spend somewhere around, I would say 500 and up to get in that 20 Hertz category. And so it's just something to consider. It takes a lot of power to play 20 Hertz. I wanna stay on this for a little bit more just because I think it's very important in that it also depends on your expectations. So if you have a speaker that can play down to, let's say only 60 Hertz and you want a sub that can just play down to 30 or 35, well, some of the less expensive subwoofers might be good enough for what you're looking for. But if you're playing this in a home theater situation where you're really trying to get the bass from the explosions, well, you're probably gonna want 20 Hertz. The other thing I look for is a subwoofer that measures flat because that is a way that some manufacturers can cheat where they'll say, yeah, it can play 20 Hertz, but then you find that it's really very boosted. And so uh, it's a tricky thing. The thing is when a subwoofer is very peaky, that's when you start hearing people talk about it sounding boomy and maybe like a one note response and that's actually what it is because it's boosted at a certain frequency and it's not even. When you get a flat response, that's when you start hearing people talk about hearing texture in the bass. In my opinion, what they're actually saying is that they're hearing all the different tones within the bass that they weren't hearing before because maybe one frequency was more accentuated than the other. So a flat response makes it easier to blend with your main speakers. The next thing to consider is how loud you wanna play it. If you are in a small room, you're not gonna need a subwoofer that plays as loud. If you're in a huge room, you're gonna need bigger subs, more of them. It just depends on how far you are from the subwoofer, how large the room is. And I would say your expectation has a lot to do with it also. How loud do you typically listen to music? So output is definitely a consideration. Going along with that theme is the driver size because the driver size oftentimes determines the amount of output that you get. And so typically the bigger the driver, the more air it can move more efficiently. It doesn't mean that a smaller driver can't produce low frequencies. It's just that you're probably gonna need more power. It might not be able to play as loud as a larger driver. And so typically larger driver equals more output. So this is a good time to mention Hoffman's Iron Law. So basically it just says that you can have a speaker that plays low, you can have a speaker that plays loud, or you can have a speaker that has a small enclosure. You can't have all of them, you're gonna have to sacrifice one. And so let's say for example, if you want something that plays low and loud, you're probably gonna need a subwoofer that is large. If you want a smaller subwoofer, let's say if it can play low, then it might not play as loud. So you kinda just have to pick your poison. And definitely you're gonna wanna look at some of the enclosure sizes because some of them can get refrigerator size. A lot of the newer technology allows a subwoofer to be much more compact, smaller. A lot of them are sealed and we'll get into that in a second, but just make sure that the subwoofer you're getting is gonna be appropriate and acceptable for your room. So that leads to the debate of whether a subwoofer should be ported or sealed. And I would say it really depends 
what they say is typically a sealed enclosure just is it's more controlled it retains more control of the driver and you can tell by pushing on a driver in a sealed enclosure it's really hard to push in and that's just because the air behind it is really much harder to compress versus a ported one when you push in air comes out of the port and that port is actually what creates the base extension the ports are typically tuned to a lower frequency than what the driver is capable of doing and so it acts as another driver in a sense it's not recommended to mix sealed and ported enclosures just because below the port tuning frequency there's an, a phase inversion which it's not good you just don't want to mix those two unless you're very advanced and you can deal with something like that but another thing to know is typically sealed enclosures are significantly smaller than the ported counterparts but the ported ones can play lower and so just something to consider it's more predictable and it doesn't bottom out below the port tuning frequency because there's no port to speak of now as far as dsp some folks are not a believer in dsp and that's fine and i think that has to do more with the fact that dsp itself creates delay which if you don't account for will make the driver the subwoofer sound slower because it actually is delayed and if you have a system where you can make it so that your main speakers and the subwoofer play at the same time meaning that you delay your main speakers in accordance to the sub then you won't get that sense now the other reason i like dsp is because they can make the subwoofer flatter and earlier i talked about the importance of having a flat response so dsp can definitely help with that it also can allow a sub in a sealed enclosure typically but also an imported one to have more bass extension than you might expect some of the systems actually have a dynamic bass boost meaning at lower volumes it allows a sub to play even lower frequencies and as you turn it up because it can't play those low frequencies at that SPL it'll start to taper that off and you won't get as much bass extension but you also won't get distortion the other important thing about digital signal processing is a lot of times they'll give the user the ability to use the DSP using parametric EQs to tailor the sound to their main listening position because even if you have a perfectly flat subwoofer the moment you put it in a room the room's going to interact and at your main listening position it might not be perfectly smooth it might have a peak which with dsp you can smooth out so that it's not that one note response that we were talking about earlier i recently reviewed some subs from elac in their vero lineup which gives you eight peqs per subwoofer and i talked about how it was useful if you plan to use it with multiple subs because you can eq all the other subs differently so that the summed response at your main listening position often not just one position but maybe multiple seats with the ability to apply eq to each sub separately you can actually use a software like multi-sub optimizer now this is advanced stuff but you can use that to tune it so all the subs play evenly at all the listening positions and so that's pretty cool if you do want to optimize for multiple seats that is a game changer if you only care about your one main listening position it's not as important but it is nice to see some systems like the elac have this functionality built in some of the other subs i've reviewed don't have this functionality in which case you would need something like the mini dsp 2x4 hd which is very popular in the home theater community just for its ability to control up to four subwoofers and do exactly what i was talking about with applying eq to every sub individually setting the delays and the levels for each sub but that is a $250 purchase. And so it's something to consider if your subs have that built in, it's one less thing for you to have to purchase. Like I said earlier, it's important that you have the capability of delaying your main speakers to match the delay inherent with subwoofers with digital signal processing. Another thing that's related is app control. A lot of these subs do have an ability to control all of this from an app on your smartphone, which I think is very handy. Even something as simple as turning up the volume is something that you can do from the comfort of your main listening position. In addition to convenience, it's also very helpful just because you can actually sit at your listening position while adjusting some of the frequencies to see what the differences are. You may want to adjust the phase to see if you're getting good summation and being able to sit where you normally sit is very important and very useful. When you're deciding between various subs, of course, we talked about whether it's the appropriate size if it's compact enough if it's within your budget 
The other thing I would like to mention is that measurements are important, especially when it comes to subwoofers. A lot of times manufacturers do not release their measurement specifications. And to me, that's a sign that maybe it doesn't measure so well, because if it did, companies would like to typically show that off. And so oftentimes you may have to look at third party measurements. You probably want to look at something called the CEA 2010 or CTA 2010 measurement, where they look at all the different frequencies and how loud that subwoofer can play it without distortion. So sure, a subwoofer can play something really loud, but if it's really distorting and sounding bad, it doesn't really matter. And that relates again to the flatness that I was talking about because a subwoofer could maybe play one frequency really loud, but the other ones, it can't play at a reasonable reference level. And so look at the subwoofers, you're looking for how low it can play, lack of distortion, and how flat it is. Of course, objective listening is also important, but what I find is Typically, if the measurements show that it's good and you have a good setup in your room, meaning you take this well measuring sub, you place it in your room and you also EQ it to account for your room, you're probably going to have a great experience. Some people talk about a subwoofer being faster, the transients being fast on the sub. Again, I think that has more to do with how it's blended with your system how it's interacting with your room and whether you have your delay set appropriately. So of course there are other key factors. Maybe you like the way a sub looks compared to another one. Maybe you have an affinity for a certain brand. For me, I have some subwoofers that I used when I was in high school in my car. And so when you talk about JL Audio, I have an, an attachment to those subwoofers. Can I afford them? They're a little bit expensive for me, but that's just something that if somebody offered them to me, I would want to have some JL Audio subwoofers. That's a personal thing. I also think that they look really cool, and that's another thing. So knowing all that, you definitely want to shop around and try to figure out which subs are the best for you, which ones check all the boxes that are important to you. So not everybody has the same check boxes, not everybody has the same weight. Maybe to one person, price is not so much of an issue, and someone else it is. We have a lot of great brands out right now. I'm reviewing some from RSL from ELAC, I previously reviewed some from SVS and Monolith, and we have a lot of great options. Definitely shop around. I'll leave a link to my subwoofer leaderboard where I rank all the subs based on my personal preference. So that'll be down below. And the other thing to consider is whether your budget can account for a single sub or multiple subs. So if you can find a subwoofer that is less expensive, but you can buy multiple versus one sub that maybe does all the same things, it's beautiful, but you can only afford one. Oftentimes it's better to get multiple subs just because you can get a smoother response using multiple subs than a single sub. Now having said that, if you really want this particular sub and you plan on getting another one, maybe you can buy the single one for the time being, knowing that you're gonna get another one later on, that's also a possibility. So anyway, I hope you found this video useful. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.